This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Now before we get into our lesson, as always, we need to make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get into our verses for today, we need to sum up a very important topic. And I say this because John's baptism is often not understood, perhaps mixed with other baptisms, and more is expected of it than should be today. Well, let's sort this out, try to get this down once and for all, because we've got to move on. And by that I mean we have things to build upon this. Number one on John's baptism, let me put the whole heading up there for you. It is not Christian baptism or Jesus' baptism, the one his disciples did while with him. Two, it did involve water, and from the accounts, it is always where there is plenty of water like the River Jordan. Three, it also appears to be immersion of the person, otherwise just use some convenient well water or water from a jug. Four. John preached the necessity of baptism of repentance that looked forward to the forgiveness of sins. That is the heart of the definition of what John's baptism is, right out of the scripture. Baptism of repentance that looked forward to the forgiveness of sins. The actual uh, Greek is baptism of repentance toward the forgiveness of sins. Five. There must be water baptism and repentance as a response to John's ministry. It was expected. Uh, we could put it this way. It's something God wanted people to do who were responding to John's ministry. Six, repentance is a change of mind, a change of direction, specifically a turning away from sin as the Old Testament prophets used it. Now I want you to see two things here what repentance is. It's a change of mind, a change of direction, what one thinks about something. But it's also in line with what the Old Testament prophets, how they used it. As John is, by the way. Seven, this is a choice as well as an act of obedience. Eight, this passage does not tell us that this rite is for actual cleansing from sin, but may be symbolic of cleansing of sin, as we'll look at that later. All right? And the reason I leave the may in there, because I want us to study it through together, I think you'll find that it is, but let's just kind of take it a step at a time, as we often do. Nine, on John's baptism, but it, is, but it is obviously a public right that shows that one has made an inner change within oneself regarding sin. 10. It does not provide forgiveness. And remember, it looks forward. That's 11. But it does look forward to forgiveness when one is cleansed by the Holy Spirit and forgiven and cleansed from sin. I don't think we have a direct connection that says it is symbolic, but it certainly seems to appear to look forward to the real one. 12. To undergo John's baptism as an affirmation that one has repented from sin. 13. It looks forward to forgiveness that would come with faith in Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. 14. For this period in history, the short period of John's ministry, 
John is preparing the people by telling them to get right with God so they are ready for the Messiah. Now remember that, we studied that earlier. This is a major part of his ministry, preparing people. How does he prepare them? Calls them to repentance. How do they get prepared? Repent. 15. John's baptism was a temporary type of baptism. I hope I've made that point to you. John's baptism could only be during the time of John the Baptist. 16. This is the first step toward salvation. Now I know that probably sounds confusing, but you just have to wait until we get to those teachings that fill in what you're probably uh, having questions about. 17. John's baptism is not for today. It is before the cross. It's pre-cross, before the resurrection, and the message that came after it. After the resurrection, you might say the gospel is filled in with what they need to know. 18. John's baptism amounts to God the Father providing a path for the Messiah to come so that all people will go, that all people will see the salvation, the saving Messiah. And that all that goes all the way back to the Isaiah passage that talked about leveling the mountains, filling in the valleys. God is preparing the people. Okay? God is preparing the people. You might even say the people of the earth. Now let's begin our study in Luke chapter 3 verse 7. Our subheading will be judgment on those who do not respond. All right. In verses 7 through 8, John addresses those in the crowd who are not there for repentance. Whatever their motive is, it's not for repentance. Verse 7. John was saying to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? It's interesting how this is phrased. He's talking to the crowds who came out to be baptized, but there was a group out there that appears to want to be, uh, they appear to want to be baptized but they reject the meaning or the purpose of it. Well, let's look at this a little bit at a time. John was saying, imperfect, continuous action. There are things he keeps saying, or this can include this entire passage. Either way, the crowd hears this warning. Notice the word crowds in plural. It can mean different types of crowds, waves of crowd, or diff different groups within the crowds, but there are different types of people within this audience. Mark 1.5 tells us that they were coming from the country of Judea and Jerusalem. So it gives us an idea, at least Mark does, where they're coming from. Matthew gets more specific within the crowd by describing that John saw the Pharisees and the, the, Pharisees and the Sadducees there. So we could add to Luke to help us fill in the gaps. They're coming from Judea and Jerusalem, and there's a bunch of the religious leaders, both Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, John has some interesting terms for them. When he says, you brood of vipers. Vipers, one of the more poisonous snakes. A brood would be like the offspring, the babies. Uh, so he's basically calling them you offspring of very poisonous snakes. Now to be called an offspring of someone or something is to imply that uh, someone uh, has a nature of that parent. To call someone an offspring of someone or something is to imply that that someone has the nature of that parent. So, they are poisonous by nature, destructive to people, just as religion is. 
Now, vipers sometimes lived in holes. That's where they'd hide and they would stay cool. They live in the ground in the desert. Uh, they are known to be driven out when there is fires around, a grass fire, a brush fire. So John is describing what they like to or they uh, flee from, fires. He goes on to say, who warned you? You brood of vipers, who warned you? The word here is hupo dek numi. To show someone something, to point out, to give direction. Here we have the nuance of warning. Who's giving you the warning? What are they being warned about? To flee the wrath to come. So the whole sentence is, the whole statement of John, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, I don't think they were sitting there waiting to give an answer. John is using this as a subtle means, though it's rather harsh, rather straightforward. But within his statement, he's telling them, you got wrath coming. And this echoes of the Old Testament prophets of warning and judgment, of wrath to come, even the day of the Lord, Isaiah 13, 9 and 20, 37. The question is to point out to them that they are there for the wrong reason. They do not understand what this is all about. So in a rather subtle way, but at the same time not so subtle, John is telling them that judgment is coming. And as we've seen in many of our studies already in the past, salvation comes with judgment. They come hand in hand. Christ will come back to deliver people at the same time judge people. People who reject salvation, the other side of that for them is judgment. To put it simple, the responsive will be saved, the unresponsive will be judged. He goes on addressing these who aren't so responsive when he says, therefore, produce fruits appropriate to your repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. He begins by saying, therefore produce fruits. Make something. Demonstrate a true change. Fruits is in the plural. Do it repeatedly. Do a lot of it. Do good deeds. Show your repentance. And this goes back to being ready for who is coming. Uh, being prepared and demonstrating it by a change of behavior. He goes on to say those fruits should be appropriate to your repentance. I think appropriate is the most appropriate term here. It's actually the word oxios, uh, having a relative high degree of comparable worth or value, kind of a long fancy definition there corresponding to something comparable to worthy of. I think some of your translations use worthy of. In other words, what you do should fit what's in your heart. It should fit your repentance. He goes on to say an interesting phrase here regarding their thinking when he says, second line, and do not begin to say to yourselves, this, is, this means don't even begin to think it. Do not do not even begin to think this. Here's what they're thinking. We have Abraham for our father. Now, of course, they saw because of their lineage, their heritage from Abraham, they saw no need of what John is calling for. John goes on to say, let me put that up here, and then we'll talk about it. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children for Abraham or to Abraham. You see, they claim that because of their relationship to Abraham, who was their physical great, 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 so on, grandfather, 
another way of saying that they're Jews, that they have the proper heritage. Their thinking is that since I am a Jew and God made promises to the Jews, such as the Abrahamic covenant, then there is no need for repentance. After all, God has to keep his promises. You see, they viewed themselves as basically in with God. All they need to do is stay in, and they do that by doing what the religious leaders tell them to do. And they are the religious leaders here to some degree. Some of them are. We would think that there would be others who follow that religion out there too. And this is similar to anyone who thinks keeping their religion will get them to heaven. John's retort again. Let me just put that part up here. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children for Abraham. Did you catch the contrast here? John as a prophet of God is telling these religious types that being a Jew will not get you to heaven. And in an exaggerated way, he's saying that it's not one's heritage or lineage or race, but as we will learn, it is being born of God through the power of the, through the, power of the Spirit, appropriated through faith. The contrast while they are thinking they are offspring of Abraham and safe from wrath, John is telling them that they are really like the offspring of venomous vipers. The third element of the argument is that God can make anyone, even stones, can be made children of Abraham, given the right conditions. One does not have to be of their lineage. Of course, that comes out much later when we see more on the Gentiles. Like everyone else, they need to repent. And they do not get it. John has another thing to teach them. Coming judgment. Verse 9. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, this would be an analogy and a teaching that Jews would be familiar with from the Old Testament. He begins by saying, even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Now already. The imagery is that of a tree about to be chopped down. The axe is in a position uh, next to the tree, uh, ready for the axeman, the woodsman, to take that tree down. And note that it's pictured as at the root. Normally, one would not cut a tree down from the root since the root is underground, but this is to make the point. Cut at the root, the tree dies. Its very life will be taken. Once this happens, that tree's over with. Now, as I said, this is common in imagery in the ancient world for judgment, both in the Old and New Testament, both for individuals and the nation. Some verses. Hosea 10, 1 through 2. Jeremiah 2, 21 through 22. 11, 16, John 15, 16. All these people that John is addressing is to hear that there is judgment. He goes on to say, Therefore every true tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The word for bear present active participle it means keep on bearing producing that's the idea when a tree in an orchard quits bearing good fruit it would be destroyed they cut it down they throw it in the burn pile so this is a warning to individuals who do not produce 
this shows a real lack of repentance. Now, if you studied John with me, you might be familiar with or recall John 15. Jesus goes into that passage saying, if you're a believer, you're going to produce. And then we talked about the consequences if you do not. Those who have a change of heart change. They change their thinking, their lives, their actions. They bear fruit. True repentance is shown by production. I think you can hold on to that part, I should say, that uh, part of the definition of repentance throughout. True repentance shows that something's changed. Now, if these listeners, this some within the groups, perhaps the entire group that is now responsive, whom John is speaking to, are incapable of doing good works, and all they can do is spread their poison, then they are doomed. That's what they need to know. Like the Old Testament Malachi said, Malachi 4.1, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. Those old religious types, they know what John's talking about. He's using scripture. He's using the teachings of scripture. Often the words, the very words of the Old Testament Well, in verse 10, John switches gears and turns to the others in the crowd. Luke 3.10, and the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? Now, these people have a genuine interest in doing the right thing. This is a crowd with a different attitude than those we just saw. These are responsive. They are wanting to know more about what John has to say. They want to know specific application for them. What should they be doing? These people want to show their change. They want to demonstrate they have repented. Now, one might think that this would come natural. That if there is repentance then they will automatically start doing the right thing. Well, it seems clear that they would stop sinning, if that's true repentance. But then what? Let me explain. Now, the audience here seems to be all adults. They have some years on them. It's also probably true there were some who were caught up into the religious system that are there. So for years, they've been doing the wrong things. For a long time. Now they've learned to repent from sin. Well, that would imply that they know they're not supposed to be doing those things, so they'd stop sinning in those areas for sure. But now they need to learn what is the right thing to do. They've learned what not to do. Now they need to learn what to do. Well, repentance doesn't teach that within itself. It basically tells you to quit sinning. So what do you do on the other end of that? There are many Christians today. People who have truly trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that do not know what to do. Some have been taught, well, you'll be taught automatically. You'll do it automatically. It's just natural. Once you have that change of heart, You've changed, you'll do the right thing. No. All Christians have to learn their way out of the wrong and into the right. I repeat that. All Christians have to learn their way out of the wrong and into the right. It's a constant series of choices, of learning and making right choices. We go back to our fundamental three principles, learning the word, believing the word, and applying the word. 
Now some argue, but God will change us. I mean, after all, we're new creatures. Yes, he will. But you have to choose to let him do it. He will change you, but you have to choose to let him do it. You have to learn what not to do and what to do. One cannot continually choose for sin and expect change in his life. And again, some might say, but I'm a new person in Christ. That's true. You are born again. You're born from above, but you still carry a sinful nature. And that needs to be, first of all, put in check by the indwelling Holy Spirit and then live by his power. That is a learned process. That is why I have this teaching in the first few lessons of the basic series. Many people try to study the Bible outside of the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, not confessing their sins. So, there's very little attentiveness. Uh, oh yeah, they can be religious, just like this religious crowd. But you need to live your Christian life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's one thing John's going to bring up here in, shortly. But understand, it's a learned process. Remember a Romans passage? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Many believers don't even confess their sins. Some of them will finally, when the sin is big enough and they start to feel guilty enough about it, or they're so miserable because of discipline. But then, because they do not know how to live by the power of the Spirit, they fall right back into sin. Now, let me give you a little extra here. If you're a Bible teacher, in any form, and the people you're teaching do not understand the importance of confessing of sin and the importance of being controlled by the Spirit, led by the power of God, enabled to do God's will. They're going to be one frustrated group. They'll end up being legalistic do-gooders because they really don't know how to live the Christian life. You can't live the Christian life unless you're living constantly by the power of the Spirit. That's one reason he gave it to us. There's another lesson here that we can draw from what we see here. You can learn about witnessing. You can often tell if someone has a genuine interest in God and Christ, the gospel, by the questions they ask. Like, what must I do to be saved? At this point, with John's ministry, the question is, then what shall we do? Verse 11, John answers. And he would answer and say to them, this means this is typical of what he would say, the man who has two shirts must share with him who has none. And he who has food must do likewise. Let's talk for a moment about the shirt. It's kind of a topic we could spend a moment on, but worth understanding. The word for shirt here is a keton. You see many translations. There's tunic, but tunic today is just, I think, misleading. But it is some sort of garment that is worn against the skin like an undergarment. And then you'd have an outer shirt on top of it. So it's almost like what we call an undershirt or a t-shirt of some sort. Let me give an example of where this fits into the dress. We see it in Luke. Just in this verse, And whoever takes away your coat, that's the himatian, do not withhold your shirt. That's the kiton. That's what we have here. From him either. So it's like you give him your outer shirt, you give them the inner shirt. That's just teaching another principle over in Luke 6. So that gives you an idea of where the ketone was. Or ketone, actually. Ketone. 
Notice also the one who has none. If you have an extra shirt, someone else has no shirt, doesn't have a shirt at all, then you are to share. Let's look at the word share. I've seen it now and then. Metadidomi, give a part of, uh, share, share with, that's the idea, to, to give with. It's used for sharing the gospel, 1 Thessalonians 2.8, and giving to the poor, Ephesians 4.28. So you share your garments and, another general principle, and he who has food must do likewise. If you come across someone who has no food and you have more than you need, share it. All right? Now we've talked about those who are people who choose to be bums on the street, people who choose to be, uh, uh, choose not to work. We've talked about in Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs, how to handle that. If you don't know, I would suggest study Proverbs. The other thing that I really get turned off about is all these requests on television. I mean, we really don't know how genuine that is, and after all, this is television, this is advertising. I know they show the sick, everything from pathetic puppies to, to elderly who don't seem to have anything to eat. Well, that's actually something you're going to have to sort out yourself, but understand the general principle is if you see someone, and I like to keep this in the actual presence, if you see someone who really doesn't have food and it's no fault of their own. Uh, now, this is my little addition to it. When I say if it's no fault of their own, and you've got extra, share it. Let's take some points here. Points about what products of repentance mean and do not mean. We'll do it under the heading, Products of Repentance. Eight points. Number one, now, this is an important part of this. John does not tell them to do sacrifices or even keep the law or any other mosaic or religious ritual. That's not the issue here. That's just what I want you to see here. He's only telling them to produce something in keeping with repentance. Don't lose sight of the context and what he's teaching on. Two, this is not a work for salvation or for God's approval. Three, it is not for merit or do goodism. Four, this is not teaching socialism or communism. It's not any kind of government policy. Five, there are ways in which genuine repentance can and should be demonstrated. Six, it is sharing with someone who is legitimately poor or without food. Now, before we go to point seven, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of ways to show that you've truly repented in your life. And during John's time, there would be many, many ways too, if not hundreds and thousands, depending on what you'd been doing wrong and what you should be doing right now. So let's understand that. This is just a sample of what John is teaching. Many applications, depending on your station in life and your situation, what you come across, who you come across. Point seven, it is a fulfillment of the higher law of love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, 31, Romans 13, 9. Eight, it is showing that one has become sensitive to the needs of others. Verse 12, go to a new group of people within the group. Even tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, 
what shall we do? Well, let's talk about tax collection for a moment. It is a complicated, a complex system for many reasons. First of all, there's all kinds of taxes. Toll taxes, sales, poll taxes, land taxes. There were different levels and types of tax collectors. Uh, some would employ others to work under them. Uh, they would bid to the, uh, the ruler. And you might say, get the contract. And he'd hire people to go out and tax. To collect the tax. And this led to all kinds of abuse. On top of what the tax collector was to collect, he'd also demand a surcharge for himself. Well, what this amounts to is that the tax collector was a generally despised person, often associated with other great sinners, especially in the eyes of the religious crowd. And those Jews who collected for Rome were also considered traitors. So to say the least, they were disliked by the Jews. So these tax collectors come up to John and they first of all call him teacher. Interesting. Didaskele, teacher, it's like rabbi. This tells us that they recognize his authority at some level. Here we see that even they are being challenged by John's message to change their behavior. And you think of it, if this is what they've been doing for years, abusing the system, gaining the system for themselves, it's a pretty big change for them. Isn't it interesting, the religious crowd doesn't even say anything about what we should do. But here the tax, tax collectors often pointed out as serious sinners by these same religious crowd who aren't responsive at all. John gives some practical advice to the tax collectors in verse 13. He says, And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. The idea is what's required of you. In other words, do not extort. Don't take or give bribes. Don't overcharge. Don't take advantage of the people. Don't take advantage of your position. Don't exploit the people. Now these are things that tax collectors did. He makes it simple. Collect no more than what you've been ordered to. Collect only what you're supposed to collect. In other words, be fair and honest. Well, it appears that soldiers were standing by. Soldiers heard this. And now they want to do. They, excuse me, they want to know what to do. Now, soldiers often worked with tax collectors. We'll talk about them in just a moment. But let's look at the verse. Verse 14. Then some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what should we do? He replied, Don't extort money nor falsely accuse, and be content with your wages. So John has a threefold answer to them. So these soldiers, let's talk about them for a moment. These would not be Roman soldiers. Uh, they wouldn't work for Jewish collectors, tax collectors. These would be soldiers from perhaps Antipas' army, Herod Antipas, perhaps uh, Police types, they're all kind of police types from Perea. That's a couple of the suggestions the scholars make. But the point is, they have, the tax collectors have soldiers with them. We see that, I, I conclude that because of the nearness of this passage. He's, so he's talking to the tax collector, turns right there and looks at the soldiers who are probably with them. So it appears that they're the ones who are uh, uh, the policemen, you might say, the enforcers to back up the tax collectors. And what's 
not even just curious, but wonderful here. They want to know what to do too. They've been convicted. They want to get right with God. John tells them, don't extort money, nor falsely accuse and be content with your wages. First of all, he says, don't extort. That's the interesting word. It's kind of like a shakedown. In fact, the word means shake. Oh. To shake, basically, is the meaning. And it also has related meanings to terrify, to threaten with violence, and we just translated extort. Use some means to improperly uh, terrify or threaten people. The other term, falsely accused, don't falsely accuse them. Suko or suka fonteo. All right. Basically, it means to accuse falsely or slander. Here it's used to get more money or intimidate people. So we can just picture them standing behind the tax collectors, maybe a couple of them, with their swords or spears, and they're backing up what the tax collector demands. Sometimes they would be involved in falsely accusing someone and threatening someone with violence, which basically means uh, you're going to pay this unfair, uh, not even uh, necessary surcharge to fill my pockets. This amounts to robbery, extortion. Perhaps they took bribes. With this instruction from John, it seems to further give evidence that these soldiers were the strong arm, the physical force behind the tax collector. So I, that's where I come out on this, who those soldiers were. John's simple command to them after this is, be content with your wages. Now, soldiers were typically, typically paid enough to get by. Uh, food, minimal substance. Some were housed in barracks. The other told to be content with their wages. They are to see what they were doing was wrong and then to be satisfied with their wages. They were not to abuse their position of authority. Let's kind of sum this up, just some words. When one truly repents from sin and turns towards God, desiring to do what is right, he will start to show love for his fellow humans. When he sees someone in genuine need, he can help, he'll do it. And if he's been dishonest or unfair or mistreating people in business, or his job, he starts being fair and honest with people. If he's in a position of authority, he doesn't abuse his authority. He treats people fairly, justly. These are all proofs that one has truly repented, that he has truly turned away from sin. And all these principles that he's just expounded on regarding doing the right thing goes back to the basic law of love your neighbor as yourself or love one another. Let's look at our translation for the day. Then we got some points to sum up with. We go back to Luke chapter 3 verse 7. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. John was saying to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore produce fruits appropriate to your repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two shirts must share with him who has none. And he who has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Then some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what should we do? He replied, Do not extort money, nor falsely accuse and be content with your wages. Let's do a summary. We'll do it in three parts. Summary review. First of all, to, to all groups. One, John is preparing the people for the reception of the Messiah who will bring salvation and judgment. Don't lose sight of the fact that this, this is what this is about. It's preparing the people. Two, this is a message that is unique and only for John the Baptist's period of ministry. Three, he both preaches and does baptism of repentance toward forgiveness of sins. Four, in our passage, we're given a good sample of his teaching. Five, he addresses the different groups that come out. Well, let's look next at what he says to the non-responsive group. One, he first speaks to those who are non-responsive to his message of repentance. Two, it is straightforward and harsh. Now, some people may think, well, how could somebody that's a Christian, like John the Baptist, be harsh? <laughs> Three, he calls them offsprings of poisonous snakes, and that judgment is coming to their type of people. That's about as straightforward and harsh as you can get. Uh, today, we would say, you're going to hell. Four, he calls them to genuine repentance that shows itself with fruit. You can make the choice. You don't have to be judged. Five, their claim is that as offspring of Abraham, they have no need to repent. Six, John's retort is that God can make anyone an offspring of Abraham. Seven. And by the way, offspring of Abraham, good reference on that is uh, Romans 4.16. 7. John teaches that judgment is on its way to those who think that being an offspring of Abraham makes them right with God. Now that's quite a statement. These people, many have lived their lives thinking they're good with God. Now they find out they're not. Not only that, they're a bunch of baby snakes. Eight, so that without genuine repentance shown by fruit, they are readying themselves for sure destruction. Well, one more group, the responsive group. One, they show their genuine repentance by requesting what should they do. Two, John teaches by giving them some practical examples. Three, if one has more than he needs of something and sees another in need of it, he should share what he has. That's really pretty simple. Four, 
those in positions of authority should not abuse their position or authority and be honest and fair in dealing with others. Now understand, this, this is broad application here. It's not just tax collectors and, and uh, soldiers. It'd be businessmen who are basically crooked. All right? Uh, politicians who are crooked. Uh, anyone that has any kind of authority or position, a salesman of any kind, a trader, uh, that is, someone who trades goods, once you've repented, now this is during John's time, that's is our emphasis, you start doing the right thing. Start being fair and just. Five. These fall under the general teaching of showing love for one's neighbor. Well, this prepares us, as it does Luke's audience, for the next topic of John's teaching on the Messiah and the Spirit. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this wonderful word that you've given us. We ask that in the power of your Spirit you will challenge us, challenge us to live the lives as we should by your Spirit. We thank you for the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.